So I'm here with Jacob from Construct3D, and they have some awesome printers here that actually have, and this is close to my heart, wood paneling on them. I, I love me some wood paneling. So first off, why do you have wood paneling on your printers, and what do you guys do? What do you guys make? What do you guys sell? So we make the premium 3D printing, like fully out the box concept, not okay. concept. Um, basically, I love Vorons, but I want more people to enjoy 3D printing Voron style. Okay. But people don't want to build those printers. So you're selling so completed assembled. Fully assembled, the Voron experience without the Voron. Okay. Um, the wood, however, is accidental. <laughs> so why wood on a printer? Because this this isn't like my old Ultimaker that's made out of laser cut MDF. Nope. This is, you know, some actual somewhat rigid wood, but why wood? Why not so, acrylic or ACM or something else? Why wood? Very particular reasons. We are focused primarily on performance, not aesthetics. Okay. It just so happens it looks good. The yeah, reason it does look being good. <laughs> is for vibration absorption, you want a fibrous material. Plastic and metal transfer the energy. It doesn't absorb the energy. And therefore, it's not a good material for a larger printer or even a printer that's going higher speeds. Otherwise, you need to really beef up the frame, and that costs a lot more than just giving it the correct side prints. So okay. we did a load of research. Turns out the best material is MDF. Really? So yeah, but no one's buying an MDF machine. No, it it, it, it looks doesn't look outdated. Right. Even though it's engineering-wise perfect, it's not a product. The second best was plywood. So your old Ulti makers and your maker bots that were made in plywood were actually using one of the best vibration absorption materials possible. But again, no one's going to buy it because it's plywood. Yep. The fourth best was bamboo. Real bamboo, not the Re printer. Real bamboo, not the printer. <laughs> we're the real bamboo company after all. <laughs> um, but we can go one step further. If plywood was the second best and bamboo's the fourth, why don't we just make plywood bamboo? So this is this is plywood with a veneer of bamboo. No, no, no. It is plywood made of bamboo. Oh. Okay. So if you look on the end grain, you can see there's three layers sandwiched between each other, going against each other. That gives you the absolute best um, vibration absorption possible, and you can actually get all of the performance, all the rigidity, all the stability, and there's no risk of any like compliance issues because it's not even a wood; it's a grass. So it's yeah. actually really good for the environment. And it looks great. Honestly, like aesthetically, I, to be honest, love the look of this machine. Like you've got two here, so they're basically the same machine. They're the same printer, just sizes. different sizes. Okay. Um, now something else I've noticed, this is a modern Core XY machine, it's enclosed. Yep. Those are V-wheels. Yes, it is. So you do have a rail on the X. Why the V-wheels on the Y? So I'll take you to that printer there. This printer is our test bed printer. Every technology, every research, argument, conversation gets tested on this before it becomes a product. We tested rails versus wheels. Turns out, it, in quality-wise, rails were about the same as wheels, but harder to place, more expensive, and they wore faster. You'd have to replace rails faster than wheels if the wheels were applied correctly. So a lot of the question is, why do you use wheels? You flip it on its head, why are rails better? And then you zoom in on that, why is the rail better? Is it the rigidity? Is it the tolerance control? Is it the contacts area? Turns out it's a mixture of all of them. So now that you've got individual components of why is one better than the other, you can identify how to solve that in a different medium. In this case, V-wheels. So for V-wheels, material is incredibly important. Delrin, so the black ones, too soft and the dust it produces ablates itself faster. Yes. Polycarbonate doesn't. It polishes itself. So you're running polycarbonate We're wheels. We're running polycarbonate wheels. Uh. Then the way it's mounted and tightened down, it creates a trapezoid instead of an offset square. I, I'm bad with shapes. I'm not a shape okay. person. Don't kill me. Um, but that gives you eight contact points overall on that gantry. If you only had six, we're using a bracket with three wheels instead of four wheels, it's not enough and you get a little bit of twisting. So you're running, oh, you are running four wheels. Yeah. Okay, so four you're running. Four wheels per side. And what happens, because no matter how the machine is made, the pressure points will change as it prints, because the rails are never perfect. Correct. So 
you get a triangle in the shape where it's pinching, say here, but this bit might be a bit tighter. And then the triangle shifts to the other side of the three wheels. Okay. Therefore, you get all the rigidity you need and all the structural strength without needing to buy a rail. Because if it goes wrong, customers hate it. For me, I'm, I'm happy to replace a rail, mm -hmm. but they might not be. Okay. The cost implication is also important. A wheel is so much cheaper and easier to replace than a rail. That is true, or a carriage. Yep. On the x-axis, it's massively important. The size, the constraints, the weight, the wheels became too heavy. A rail was a guarantee for that. And because of how it's designed with only one rail, you don't need to worry about the cost of tolerancing when you're using two rails. That's where a lot of that price ends up being, is to match the friction levels between the rails. Okay. Otherwise you get racking. So essentially what you've kind of figured out through your testing with the test bed machine is essentially like, in terms of like tiers of quality, you yeah. would have like the V wheels that you would find on like a, an, Ender, an Ender 3, yeah. for example, is like the Quantum. Yeah. But if you do, but just buying rails off AliExpress or whatever, yeah. that's an immediate upgrade. Uh, immediately. But into if you spend the time to actually hunt down and do V wheels properly, they actually beat yeah. a generic rail. A generic rail, not the yeah. premium rails. Yeah, so if you go, if you want to, you know, premium rails are premium rails, but they're premium. Like, I don't have that money, yeah. neither do you. So off the shelf rails would be an upgrade for V-Wheel, yeah. but if you take the time and do V-Wheels correctly, they can come out better than just like generic rails. Yes, okay. exactly. That makes a lot of sense. And the I've... cost implication, from a factory point of view, I want to earn as much money as possible. From a maker point of view, I want to make it as cheaply as possible. Yes. So this was like the best of both. Okay. I get to make a premium product, so the quality that you expect is there, but in terms of your repair costs, it's £1.20 in the UK for a wheel, and it takes five minutes to replace. And that is so important to me because if you can't repair your printer easily, it's just a toy that you can't afford to use. Correct, because even if you're buying a, a, a pre-assembled machine and you're expecting just to take it out of the box and use it, a 3D printer does have consumable items on it. Bowden tubes, PTFE, wheels, Stuff does wear out. Stuff and does need to rails. be replaced. You'll be surprised how fast rails actually wear down. We found with heavy testing, eight months. Of is, continuous use? Of continuous use. Is that with like generic rails? Uh, generic rails, but it wasn't the rails fault. It was the materials fault that you're printing with. So I'm oh, sure you, you printed an like, ASA and ABS, yep. get that white powder. That binds up the bearings and starts to corrode them. It's even faster with carbon fiber filaments because you get galvanic corrosion with the carbon because of the electrical differences between yep. them. And that just destroys rails. Even if you heavily lube them, it gets caught in the lubrication, destroys the rail. Okay. So if for machines that are gonna see a lot of production use, you found that this application, this setup for the XY seems yep. to hold up the best. It, it holds up better. We're looking at about two years between replacement of the wheels and maybe four months between tightening of the wheels. And that's with but heavy that's use. But that's not because the wheels are ablating, that's because they're shaping to the rail better. Okay, and, that, and that's with heavy use? Yeah, okay. very heavy use. Um, so this machine here, it, this is as it comes, does it include a top hat? No top hat, because okay. when we were designing it, we were very aware that Stratasys still had a patent on it for just oh. a lid. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> obviously it's expired now, but the design was locked in. Okay. So it's not there yet, but it's completely acceptable. It wouldn't be too hard to put a top hat on here for printing it ABS ASA though. We just now need to find a, a good quality design for the lids. But do the machines have a name or are they just construct? Yeah, so this is Construct One. Okay. And that's the Construct One XL. Okay, so the same machine, just different sizes. Yep. Uh, it does appear, I don't know if this one's on, this one's not on, but they do run RepRap firmware? They run RepRap firmware. Okay. And what controller do you have in them? So these ones have a Duet 2. Okay. Um, they're true, battle tested, and tested. Yeah. So Duet Two is proven. I've been using them for years. Honestly, they're way too powerful for what we need in 3D printers. They're nice to have, but you don't need yeah. something that powerful. But we put that because a lot of our uh, our customers are universities as well. So okay. they like being able to modify their hardware to match what they're doing. So say they're making like algae filament, and they need a special extruder that they've designed themselves. We give them that functionality by using the best motherboards we can. Yeah, because RepRap, it's easy to change the config on oh, it. It's so just, easy. It's just a notepad, essentially. Oh, it's like Clipper. Basically. Yeah, it's okay. so nice to yeah. actually use. And as you guys know, I'm a huge fan of not putting Clipper on commercial machines. I love Clipper. Don't get me wrong. I love me Clipper. And then we have some pot ends here, or what looks like pot ends. What are these? So, 
the future, as we can probably have all imagined, is faster, better, and stronger. The question is, how do you go faster? Now, a lot of people are using CHT nozzles now to get the, the increased flow rate, but that will be so far. Okay, they, they've started doing talks in here, so we've moved to a more scenic look location. I mean, look at this, like, oh, it is Oxford University. Okay, so, um, you're talking about higher flow rates. So what are we looking at here? What are these components and what is, what is this octopus looking thing? Basically, we need to go faster and there's only two solutions. You go longer melt chamber or you figure something else out. We're doing the figure something else out because the longer melt chamber has two issues. Oozing, because of more pressure, more ooze. And you get a fulcrum issue. So because it's so long, any force on the tip is gonna bend your heat break. Yes, really uh, E3D down. super volcano. Exactly. Good it, I've already bent three of them in research and it, I cry every time. It's such a pain to replace when you bend it. Yep. Um, so what you can do is you can chop up the melt chamber into individual segments and melt them individually and then merge them back into one output. So is, that's what this is That's here. what that is. So this one is the theoretical highest flow possible, and that's the inside of it. So not only do you have what, six? Six inputs, in, goes this is one output. And it's also split, so you also get that same effect like a CHT yes, would have. That is the goal. But it's not without its challenges. So because oh, these I are bet. metal 3D printed, this rough surface texture on the outside is also on the inside. So it's now a challenge of how do we manufacture it in a way that doesn't cost the £2,000 that single one cost to make. Ooh. And then how do we smooth out the inside so it actually flows consistently without increasing the pressure. We've currently like stabilized, ironically, on using glow-in-the-dark filament to smooth it out. You're lapping it with filament. Lapping it with filament. Because <laughs> it goes inside it anyway. It's it not going to damage it too much. And it's a controlled process. Using an acid etch, you can't ever be too certain. And no. because it's metal 3D printed, there's micro voids. So you've got to be really careful with what you're doing. So we had Warwick Manufacturing Group. They CT scanned the entire thing. And we got a tolerance analysis of all of the surface. Um, and it's rough. It's like sandpaper on the inside. Oh, I bet. I so bet. now we're going to lap it all with glow-in-the-dark filament. And then we're going to re-CT scan it, and then we can work out how much filament per amount of lapping it does. <laughs> so then we can actually work a process, because glow in the dark filament is really cheap, and yeah. using chemicals is not. So if we can do it that way. It's, we can probably make a really cheap high flow nozzle that doesn't increase the length, and should be able to fit on most machines. It, it, there is going to be a cost of weight, though. It, there, this is going to be a bit heavy. So you say that that's the same weight as a copper volcano heat break. Really? Yeah. So I heat block. Actually, actually, what is it, aluminum or? Just, yeah, aluminum. No. Hmm. And then, what is this thing here? It looks like an old carburetor or something. Basically, the challenge of manufacturing is now that you've got six inputs, how do you cool six heat breaks? You can't just machine it because a six axis machine is way too expensive and way too high tech for what we're needing. It's actually more cost effective to print the, the heat sink itself and just machine the little bits you need. And you can get all the geometry you require for what you're doing. This is overkill, but for testing, overkill is better because you never want your heat sink to be like the weakest part when you're testing the heat block. That was cool. Yeah, I, again, E3D have just come out with the Roto, so yep. they're using 3D printed heat sinks there, so it it's works. starting to become a thing. It's it it has an official place in manufacturing. And if we can use that, it just makes it even cooler. That is really cool and really neat. This is something like, it, it's like, you don't realize it's a practical thing until you actually kind of see it. It doesn't work yet, but it's One showing day. really good promise. One day. In theory, this can do 320 cubic millimeters per second. At the moment, it's only doing about 80. Well, it's still a great number, but it can go higher. And we're figuring out why isn't it going higher. Is it pressure? Is it filament? Is it a mixture of all of them? Friction currently? At the moment, it's friction. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob from Construct3D for taking the time to chat. Videos from this year's Sanjay Mortimer RepRap Festival are brought to you by LDO Motors. For printer parts, kits, accessories, and more, check them out at the link in the description.